not enough to be busy, so are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? And that's Henry David Thoreau. Uh, our speaker for tonight is busy about ants. So inspiringly busy about ants, in fact, that she ended up as the subject of some art about it, full circle. Uh, here to share with us her research, knowledge, and passion about these fascinating little creatures is entomologist Dr. Cory Moreau. Um, you can read her full bio in the programs at your dinner table, but to give you the briefest of tastes, uh, Dr. Cory Moreau earned her PhD in evolutionary biology from Harvard University and was a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Before this, she completed her undergraduate and master's degrees in biology at San Francisco State University. Currently, Dr. Moreau is a tenured associate curator slash professor at the Field Museum of, no, Field Museum of Natural <laughs> History in Chicago. She's also a faculty member and lecturer at the University of Chicago in the Community on Evolutionary Biology. Please welcome Dr. Cory Moreau. Thank you. So I have to say I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, as a scientist, we often don't get the opportunity to interact with artists that much. Um, I've had a few chances through my career, but actually moving to Chicago was one of those eye-opening experiences because being on the museum campus, we have this you know, close connection with the School of the Art Institute. So as a scientist, when people reach out to me and say, hey, I want to come work in your lab, usually it's because they're biologists or they're interested in genomics or something like that. And when I arrived in Chicago, suddenly I had a lot of artists saying, hey, look, I'm in the School of the Art Institute, and I want to come hang out in your lab. And I thought, oh, okay, why? <laughs> But it turns out that it's been a really fruitful connection for me. One, it sort of pushed me to think outside the box. It's taught me how to like visualize some of the science, hopefully I do justice in some parts. Um, but also I've had a, this opportunity to interact with lots of great people. Um, I want to give a shout out to a couple, um, one of which is Grayson Brillmeyer, who was a, um, a graduate of the School of the Art Institute and came and did her um, internship with me during her undergraduate. She's an amazing artist, but really got hooked on science and collections and is now, she did a master's degree at Berkeley, she's now doing a PhD on the connection between art and collections, which for me is kind of a really interesting way to think about the things we do. Um, I was actually recommended to give this talk by an astronomer, which is really exciting that a scientist outside my field recommended me to come tonight. But surprisingly to me, Stephanie Kimmel, who you actually, I mean, Stephanie Krim, who you get, just got to hear a little bit about, she interned in my lab. I didn't even know she was here tonight until I showed up. Here, and, and she was one of the art students who came. So it's really like full circle for me to be here tonight. All right, so I'm gonna share a bit with you guys about what I do. I will tell you that I was told to make it scientific. So I will try not to talk too high up, but the graphs are gonna be tough. I will explain everything. Um, but we'll get through it together, I promise. All right, so. I get to travel around the world collecting bugs. So I'm gonna talk a lot about symbiosis, I'm gonna talk a lot about you know, the interactions of ants with other things in the environment. But I don't usually include this slide, because I don't usually tell people how I get those specimens, but it dawned on me that, you guys may not get to know, I get to run through the jungles of the world, which is awesome. <laughs> I've been to every continent except Antarctica, there are no ants there, so there's no reason to go. Um, so this is me actually in the rainforest of Australia. This is my entire lab. I dragged them down to Costa Rica to do a bunch of experiments. You'll actually hear a bit about that. Um, and I just flew home from South America about a week ago. Well, yeah, I guess so. Um, and this is a picture of me. I, I study a lot of ants that live up in the canopy. So the French have built this amazing system in French Guiana in South America that pulls you up into the canopy and then you drive it and you get to drop down into the trees wherever you sort of use your remote control to collect ants. It was awesome. <laughs> um, and it's super great and I have, I love doing field work. I actually try to spend a lot of the time in the field. I've actually am hitting five continents in three months this year. I'm actually leaving to India in about three weeks. Um, but it's not all glamorous as you can imagine. Uh, I'm not going to show you all of the terror, but this is actually an example of that. So I went and did a bunch of field work in Africa. And the whole time I was in the field, my nose was bothering me. When I got home, this giant gorgeous tick had been up my nose the whole time. Oh, oh my god. Uh, and so I showed a friend of mine who's a microbiologist, and he was like, he's like, oh my gosh, he's like, you're like a real explorer. And I was like, my nose? I don't know that qualifies. But, so I'm not gonna spend time, but I mean it's one of the beauties of being an evolutionary biologist is that I travel the world collecting bugs. Like that is like a dream come true. All right, so what do I do? So as far as thinking about research, I'm really interested in species interactions. 
I want to understand not just like why we have so many species and why they're found where they are, but how does that interaction drive that relationship? You know, why is it that in some places we have a lot of species and a lot of sort of symbiosis and other places we don't? And why is it that some organisms engage in symbiosis and others don't? And so how does that play out in sort of understanding that, you know, broad diversity we see across the globe? From plants to fungi to bacteria to animals. I'm just gonna tell you guys now, keep this in mind. Insects are animals. <laughs> You'd be surprised how few people know that. Okay, but so as an evolutionary biologist, I tend to think of the world like this. And what this is is essentially is an evolutionary tree or a family tree, right? And so we can draw those for our own families. We can sort of say, okay, our you know, we're the offspring of our parents and they're the offspring of their parents, and they're the offspring, and you can sort of draw that backwards, right? You can say, well, you're a, a, you know, a related to your siblings. So that's what we do in evolutionary biology, is we reconstruct these giant family relationships. So in this case, what we're looking at is the family relationships of apes, right? And so from this, we can see that chimpanzee's closest relative is a bonobo. And then in turn, they're closely related to humans, right? So we can say something about who's related. But for me, that's just the beginning. We get the family relationships, and then from that, we can ask tons of cool questions. One, we might want to understand the evolution of traits. We might want to know how many times has hair been lost across the body. We might want to know how many times have they evolved symbiotic relationships with gut bacteria or have parasites living in their fur. We might want to know where are they distributed across the globe. Does it tell us something about the pattern? Some are found only in Africa, some lineages. Some are found only in South America. What does that tell us? So we can actually map those on the tree and understand the evolution of those traits. In addition, we might want to ask, why are there branching events? Why did things split? Why did something that was going along as a single species now become two? Are there any factors that explain that? We might also want to know something about the, what's happened along the branch, how much change has happened. So we might ask, how many times has a new sort of anatomy evolved? Or how much molecular change? Why is it that some things have really fast genome evolution and some things have really slow? So we can start to look at those across the phylogeny. And lastly, if we can have some mechanism for putting time on that, we can ask when did things evolve? And that, as an evolutionary biologist, is really exciting. So I would argue that ants are sort of one of the most remarkable groups of organisms to ask questions about symbiosis. So for those of you, I actually know one person in the room knows who E.O. Wilson is, or Edward Wilson. I do. Yay, cheers! <laughs> <laughs> so I he's E.O. Wilson quotes today when I was Googling. <laughs> Excellent. So he's one of the most famous sort of, you know, biologists of our time. He's an amazing person. He was one of my PhD advisors. He's written more books than I'm probably old, which is, I'm old. Um, but he actually had once said that ants were the little things that run the world. And so you know, having been a student, I of course believed this. But now that I've started studying the bacteria that are stuffed inside of the host, I actually think they're the little things that are running little things that run the world. Um, and so the reason I think ants are great for studying symbiosis is that they engage in symbiosis with lots of kinds of things with other animals. So here they're tending sap producing insects. So the, these caterpillars produce sap out of a special gland to attract the ants to come and lick it up. It's like honey water. It's one of the ingredients of our bees and bees tonight. Um, and in return, they'll defend this from other things predating them. So it's a symbiosis in which they're sort of, one's protecting the other and the other's feeding the other. We also know that they engage in symbiosis with kinds of fungi, both in positive ways, things like leaf cutter ants, but in negative ways, things like the zombie ants. You've probably heard about the cordyceps that infects the brains of ants and changes their behavior. We also know that they engage in symbiosis with plants so that they are essentially mutualists with their plant hosts. So much like here, they're getting some kind of a reward from the plant and in return, they defend the plant. And so they engage in symbiosis, and here's an example of that honeydew, but they also engage in symbiosis within their bodies, and even in the form of lots of kinds of bacteria, and I'll talk a bit about that. So therefore, as a student of you know, insects, and ants in particular, I spent a lot of time focusing on insects. And you might study a lot in the classroom, or for me, a lot in the molecular biology lab, but then you get to the rainforest, and all bets are off suddenly you realize it's not just an ant hanging out with an ant, right? It's suddenly it's interacting in the environment. So if it's interacting with plants that it's engaged in mutualisms with or it has gut bacteria or it's being parasitized by a fungi, I have to think about that when I'm thinking about the evolution of the ants themselves. So for me, it's about taking that sort of context of all the things it's interacting with to think about the evolution of the group. So I'm gonna tell you about two different sort of research programs that we've done in my lab. One is on the ant evolution of ants themselves. The second is on the symbiotic bacteria that live with them. And then I'll finish up with explaining sort of how I became a cartoon character. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so first is on the evolution and biogeography. So biogeography just means where are they found in the world. So why is it that some species are very widespread, some are found only in South America, some are only found in one small region of South America? What can we infer about their history and why that is? So why is it that we'd expect an interaction between plants and, and, and ants? So unlike honeybees, right, that are going around, you know, pollinating plant, you can imagine that if a new floral morphology or a new floral anatomy evolves, you might have to have a bee that has a specialized tongue to, you know, be able to reciprocate that. So you might have this sort of, you know, dance between speciation and the organism. Ants don't do that. They're actually poor pollinators. So why would it be to expect this sort of co-diversification? Well, in the case of ants, there's actually been a little bit of literature that suggests that we might expect to see some sort of response. And that is because we know that many ants um, interact with those flowering plant forests, right? And we know that they sort of expanded their range during the expansion of those flowering plant forests. So forests that we typically interact with come in two forms: a conifer or a pine forest, right? You've all seen pine forests. They're you know, they have the needles. They're you know they're not very diverse. The canopy's not very closed. And then you have flat flowering plant forests or angiosperms, and those are things like oak woodland savannas or rainforests, right? So as those rainforests spread across the globe, it looks like ants were responding to that because it had lots of new places for them to live. In addition, we also see that ants start to shift their diets from being primarily urban and predatory. So ants are nested well within the wasps, and we know that they were their earliest ancestors, ancestors were predatory. But they be began to have those associations with plants, either feeding directly on them or through that sac-producing insect relationship. But maybe more critically, from the plant's point of view, if they're not pollinating them, why would the plants care? Well, in this case, we actually know that ants are still critical to plant biology. So in many cases, ants are responsible for spreading the seeds of, ant, of plants. So what you're looking at here is a seed of a plant, and this little sort of case is called an eliasome. And the plant produces this just to attract ants. It's full of fat and protein. And the reason they do that is an ant will come and pick it up under the tree it was found, drag it off to their nest, eat off the eliasome and then discard the seed. And the reason that that's critical is that as a, you know, a parent plant, you don't want to have competition for resources with your own offspring, right? You're going to limit the chance that they can survive. You're already fully grown, you have access to the environment. So by essentially recruiting the ants to do the work of dispersing your seeds, you're ensuring that they have a better chance of survival. And so this seed dispersal by ants has evolved across the flowering plants. It's happened many, many times, so we know that it's important to plant. So I told you before that I think about the world in evolutionary trees, right, or family relationships. And so in order to understand what role symbiosis has across the ants, the first thing I needed was a big giant ant family tree. And so that's what I did. And so here what we do is we sequence lots of DNA so that we can infer how things are related. So just like if we want to do a paternity test in us, right, you can sort of send off your samples and they'll sequence parts of your DNA and they can tell us who's related. We do the same thing with lots of other organisms. Now, the week that our paper was published, it got a lot of press, and I will tell you that all the press sources got it right, with the exception of one, foxnews.com. <laughs> <laughs> Take that for what you will. And what they said is that we had analyzed the DNA of fossilized ants trapped in amber. Right, so you guys have probably all seen Jurassic Park, where right. stick that little syringe in there and they pull out the DNA of the mosquito. I wish that's what we did. <laughs> it's not what we did. We did use fossils, but it's not how we sort of took advantage of that information. So what we did is once we had the family tree, we went in and we said, all right, how many fossil ants are there? Can we fit them into the framework of the you know, evolutionary relationships we know? And once we did that, we were able to take 43 fossils and place them along the tree where we know they belong. And the reason that this is important is it tells us something about when those particular groups evolved, right? So for example, we might have had an ant here in amber, and we could assign it to a lineage here. We could say, well, if this fossil is 20 million years old, then this clade must be at the minimum 20 years old, and it could be older. And for this example here, maybe it, it's out here, maybe it's 100 million years. So we can sort of use that to put a timeline on the ants. And once we did that, it allowed us to infer an age for the ants. Now, for me as an ant biologist, that's exciting, right? I want to know how old ants are. We said they're somewhere between 140 and 168 million years. That's a long time ago. The oldest ant fossil is about 100 million years. So we're saying that you know ants evolved prior to the fossil record, maybe not surprising. But you know, maybe that's not where the story ends. So now we know an age for the ants, but we want to put that in the context of what was happening on the planet. 
But when we looked at this tree, it looked like a lot of those branching parts are happening right there, right? So if you look here, there's just a lot of straight lines. <coughs> you look at there's a few branches, but not that many. Most seem to be concentrated. So I began to think about, well, why? Remember I told you before, why is it the two lineages split into one? We can start to ask the question, why is it we had one thing go along and split into two? And in this case, in a very narrow time frame, suddenly everything started splitting all at once. And so we use a lot of statistical analyses to try to figure this out. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, other than to say, what you're looking at here in this graph is the present through 200 million years ago. And then what we're saying is how many of those branches split through time? And, or we bend them to sort of make it easier for the eye to see in this sort of bar graph. And what you'll see is they're sort of increasing, they're increasing, and then suddenly there's a giant jump. So we wanted to understand what was happening. Why would suddenly there be a jump in the number of species of ants on the planet right around that time? And what it turns out is if we overlay on that family tree what was happening, <coughs> that's where we see the rise and expansion of those flowering plant forests. So suddenly, as those forests were expanding across the, across the globe, the ants were going crazy. Now, we see this pattern, but we want to understand what role does geography play in that, right? And there's this really interesting sort of phenomenon that's been noted. And if you've ever spent time going to the tropics, you know that there's a lot of species around the tropics. And as you move towards the poles, we decrease in them. And that's called the latitudinal species gradient, or latitudinal diversity gradient. And, and essentially, if you go to the tropics, there's lots of species of everything. And then you get to the poles, and there's still species, but there's a lot fewer. So biologists, evolutionary biologists, have like puzzled over this for centuries. And so we want to understand why that is. And so what you're looking at here is a map of ant diversity, the number of species found around the globe. The warmer parts of the map tell us there's more species there. The cooler parts of the map tell us that there's less species there. And so what you can see is right around where the equator is is where we have the most species of ants. Now this is true for lots of kinds of organisms, but we want to understand why. Why is it that we see this pattern? And so again, to understand that, we had to build an even bigger family tree for the ants so we can include more information about where they're found. And we wanted to ask the question that's been proposed by other biologists, why is it we see that diversity? So this guy, Stebbins, in 1974, had said, listen, the reason we see more species in the tropics is that it acts like a cradle. And what that means is it's where new species are being born all the time. It's just a species come, generating diversity all the time. And even if you sort of had a evenness of species at the start, because the tropics are pumping out more all the time, if we measure it now, we just have more species there. And there's going to be less species up top because it's a slower rate. But he also said, well, maybe it's the flip side. Maybe it's that the tropical regions or museums where the oldest lineages are persisting. And so maybe there wasn't much diversity on the globe. All the old lineages survived in the tropics. And there's an even diversity happening across the globe. So even if we're producing 100 new species per year in those regions, because there was already standing species in that region, we just have more. And so that allowed us to sort of test some hypotheses or some expectations. So how do we do that? So what we did is for every one of those ants that I sequenced their DNA, we went back in and said, all right, where on the planet are they found? And we broke the world up into these broad biogeographic regions. And then I said, okay, is this species, where is it found? Okay, it's only found in one region. This one's found in multiple regions, right? And we assigned each and every species to where it's found. And then we sort of wanted to include time. Because these regions are really broad, and even though we tend to think of the globe like this, we know it hasn't always been in that configuration, right? So for example, if we have a lineage that's found in South America, the probability of it being able to just easily move to Africa 150 million years ago is one, meaning 100%. Those continents were touching. So we would expect that it would be easy to jump back and forth. But as those continents drifted apart, we need to account for that. Because now the migration probability between those things is actually pretty difficult. So we incorporated that sort of shift through time in our analyses. So what did we find? What you'll notice here is that the pies on this tree tell us where we have inferred ants were living in the long-term history. And you'll notice that almost everything is green, and that's the neotropics. Well, if you spent time in the neotropics, which is South America, right, and a little bit of Central America, you know there are tons of ants. But what's even more interesting is that although you can't see the tips, Coupling that information about what we know about the species and what we saw, and there's more species of ants living in that region. So it really looks like the neotropics were important. But we know a lot about plant evolution and about plant sort of geography. 
So then now the question is, are the ants just following behind the plants as they move across the globe? But it turns out that that's not, in fact, the case. They're not just following behind. Now, in many cases, the ants were already there. And as soon as those flowering plant forests arrived, they took advantage of it. But they didn't necessarily arrive with them. So in the case of that sort of hypothesis, what we see is that the tropics are actually both as a museum, where we have all those oldest lineages we can see through time. And all these tips are green, a lot of them. So it tells us that it's also where it's a cradle. New species are constantly arising in the tropical regions, especially in the neotropics. So what does this tell us about ant evolution? Well, essentially what we see is that the flowering plant forest had a gigantic impact on the evolution of ants and lots of other kinds of organisms. Now, why would that be? So if you've ever spent time in a pine forest, right, you look up and the canopy is not very complex. And in fact, there are no ants that live in a pine forest canopy. But as you saw from that picture of me scaling up into the canopy, lots of ants live up there, right? So essentially, they're moving up into this very complex structure to build their homes in a way that had not been seen before. In addition, as I alluded to before, they're transitioning from being primarily predatory to then being able to derive all or most of their nutrients from plants, either directly from feeding on a plant or indirectly from getting honeydew from sap producing insects. So essentially we're seeing this shift in their diet and a shift in where they're living in response to the expansion of a novel niche or a novel environment. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a bit about the work we've been doing looking at the association of bacteria with ants and what role this might have in thinking about their evolutionary history and that shift onto the herbivorous diet. So why is it we would wanna study the gut microbes of ants? I'm sure you've all heard about the microbiome in the news and they're telling you stop using you know, antimicrobial hand sanitizer. If you're using it, stop using antimicrobial hand sanitizer. <laughs> I cannot say that enough. Um, we all have bacteria on us all the time and most of them are good. And when you use that stuff, you kill all of them indiscriminately and then you have the bad ones take over. <laughs> stop using it. Okay, so why is it that we wouldn't wanna study microbes in ants? Um, well, it turns out that ants are a great system to study it because they not only engage in lots of kinds of symbiosis, but they have a lot of their biology that makes them really appealing. First off, we can study diet and nutrition because we want to understand how often do diets or nutritional choices affect our gut microbial community. So what makes it interesting in the ants is that they've evolved herbivory lots of times. So we can say instead of just studying it one off, right? So in human populations, there are very few entire human populations that feed on a strictly herbivorous diet or a vegetarian diet, right? So we might study something and see something different. We have no way of replicating that to know if that's related to the diet or something about their genetics, right? But within the ants, because the herbivory has evolved multiple times, we can start saying, well, what is it about that diet choice? In addition, we want to understand how microbes are transmitted. We want to understand how they're transmitted among us. We want to understand how they're transmitted among lots of kinds of organisms. And since ants are social, they're a great system to sort of say, what role do interactions play in sort of transmitting microbes? If you need beneficial microbes, how do you acquire them? And we might want to understand why and when do we see sort of co-evolution between these things? Why is it that a microbe might become so associated with a host that they're essentially tracking their evolutionary history together? Or when would we maybe expect not to see that? When do things become parasitic? And lastly, we can ask the question about geography, because there's always the question of, if we find some interesting bacteria, are they just acquiring it in the environment in which they're found? So if we can find similar microbes in ants that are engaging either in similar behaviors or on similar diets, but repeated across different environments, we can rule out environment. So in order to understand something about the bacteria in ants, when I first started collaborating on this work with my colleague, Jake Russell, um, nobody was studying that much about ant microbes, at least not across the diversity of ants. So the first thing we had to know was what was there. So we essentially went in and screened almost 400 individual ants from 150 ant genera and just said, what bacteria do we find? Like no one really knew. And so maybe not surprising, we found a lot of bacteria associated with ants. But for us, what got really exciting, pardon me, is that this group jumped out. So it's a group of bacteria called Rhizobialis. Now you may or may not have ever heard of this, and if you have, it's because these are bacteria, so these are legumes, right? So many of the beans that we eat, soybeans is a great example. And these are the roots of the soybeans. And every one of those sort of little nodes is called a nodule. And those are produced by the plant and housed inside are a group of bacteria called rhizobia that fix atmospheric nitrogen for the plant. So the plant is essentially getting nutrients from the bacteria that it's living with. 
And so now the question is, why are we finding a related group of bacteria inside the guts of ants? Are they responsible for some similar process? Now, if we use a mechanism for studying what they eat, so trophic ecology or trophic level just refers to where do they sit on the spectrum? So are they highly predatory? Things like this, or these are the army ants, right? You've probably heard of these rotting ants that sort of spread through the forest consuming every animal, including insects, right, that they find. Um, or are they sort of, you know, where are they found on the low end? So these are things that are entirely herbivorous, right, or vegetarian. And what we see is that we only find an association with those bacteria rhizobiales when they're feeding low on the trophic scale. So there's no ants out here that have an association with the group of bacteria that are related to these ones found in plants, except those that are essentially vegetarian. So why do we find that pattern? Well, you may have noticed that there are two points that have no association with rhizobiales, but are essentially vegetarian or herbivores. And these are a group of ants called the carpenterans and their relatives, where we already know that they have a long-term association with bacteria, so long-term that a part of their internal anatomy has become specialized a pouch just to hold their co-evolved bacteria that upregulate their diet. So it appears that if you're going to essentially be entirely herbivorous, you have a specialized pouch full of a group of bacteria called Lachmania, or you have an association with these ants, which are these bacteria called Rhizobiales. So it's another hint that there might be some important aspect of diet that's driving the bacterial association of these, of these groups. So what you're looking at is a family tree of the bacteria. So we sequenced the bacteria out of the guts of these ants, and then we color coded them by the host or the environment from which they came. And what you'll notice is that all of those that are associated with ants, with very few exceptions, are all grouping together, <coughs> suggesting that there's something special about being within an ant. And once it gets into an ant, it's tracking the evolutionary history of the ant's host. So it's not hopping around a lot. And so that's kind of interesting. But now it begs the question, well, what about from the ant's point of view? So if we reconstruct the association of this group of bacteria with the ant's evolutionary history, what we see is it's essentially an association five <coughs> times independently. It's not like one-to-one, -one, that the bacteria got in the ants and the ants are evolving and the bacteria are just following them. It's not the case at all. It's that the bacteria has gotten to these ants independently five times and then is tracking the ant host. And interestingly, when we do some statistical analyses, what we're able to demonstrate is it's always associated with being herbivorous and in many cases moving up into the canopy. So again, it's something about that environment and that food source that's driving the bacterial communities that we have. Now, we want to understand something about where the bacteria are found. So in most human microbiome studies, right, so if we want to understand do we have healthy microbes in our gut, how do they change when we respond to food, the way that we do those is from fecal swabs, right? And we actually know that that's pretty biased. It doesn't actually tell us what bacteria are there all the time and which compartment they're in. But with an ants, we can actually go in and say, where exactly are they found? Are they putatively involved in nutrition? And so. What this means is I spent a lot of hours under a microscope dissecting out the guts of ants. So this compartment here is just the equivalent of the tail end of the ant. And I have to pull out each of these compartments independently under a microscope. So there's no copy that stays. Um, but what we want to control for is like, what is it that the ants are just interacting with the environment, right? We want to know, is it just something they've picked up, right? So we sequence all of the bacteria from one leg. Now again, it might be something that they're either holding in their mouth, or maybe they're even eating it, but it doesn't sort of become a member of their bacterial community. So we actually dissect out a part of the mouth compartment to look at the bacteria. And then we look at three separate compartments of the digestive tract. Now, if any of you have ever observed ants um, interacting with one another, they'll actually often spend a lot of time mouth to mouth, and that's because they're exchanging liquid food sources. It's called social trophallaxis. It's just regurgitation. So just like baby birds and moths, right? So we sort of just see that's a way of sharing food. So since ants can't carry with their hands, if they find a liquid food source and they want to take it back to share with other individuals, they fill up this part of their <coughs> stomach called the crop, which is their social stomach. And it can expand and no digestion <laughs> happens. Are we going to do that later? <laughs> <laughs> so it expands and then they can regurgitate it through the nest. Well, digestion only starts to happen once food gets into the mid gut or the hind gut, right? And so these are the equivalents of parts of our digestive tract. Right? Maybe this could be like our stomach, our large intestines, and our small intestines, right? And so we want to understand, are there differences in where those bacteria are found in the different compartments? Now we have some hints that there might be interesting bacteria there. So this is a way of visualizing 
um, DNA or cells inside of an organism. So what this is is a form of fluorescent microscopy where we use a stain that adheres to DNA. So what that means is it's adhering to all of the ant's DNA and all of the bacteria. So for example, what we're looking at here is the esophagus, so it's just like our esophagus. And every one of those bright dots is the ant's cells, right? Because each of our, our entire esophagus is made up of our own cells that are sort of knit together in a tube. And we can see that here. Now that social stomach or crop, again, we can see all of these dots, right, that are essentially the ant's host cells. And this is a special structure called a proventriculus. And what it is is a valve. Because I told you before that they can hold food in this and no digestion happens and then they can regurgitate it. But you need a mechanism to make sure it doesn't sort of just leak through. And that's what this is. It's called a, a, essentially this mechanism for making sure that it only passes once the organism decides to digest. Now once we move into the mid-gut, so that's this thumb-like structure, again you can see all of the ant's host cells, and then you can see the sea of bacteria, right? So bacterial cells are significantly smaller than animal cells. And what this says is this ant has a lot of bacteria associated with the part of the digestive system where, dig where digestion actually begins to occur. So maybe we would expect to see some interesting bacteria there. So we use different methods to assess what bacteria we see. And what you're looking at here are just pie graphs of the bacteria. And you'll notice that you're already starting to see some differences in different parts of the digestive system, right? That they're not necessarily identical. But another way to visualize that is this way. Oops, no idea what happened there. <laughs> We'll solve this riddle, don't worry. <laughs> Might have someone advance for us. All right, sorry. All right, where were we? Okay, so what we're looking at now is not just one bacteria. We're saying what are all the bacteria found within the gut, so the entire bacterial community. And how similar are they among these different individuals that we sampled and those different tissues? So if we look at all the samples that came from the leg, the mouth, and that social stomach, right, where we know no digestion is happening, they're kind of distributed all across the space. There's no signature that they're very similar. But once we move into the parts of the body that are involved in digestion, suddenly that entire bacterial community becomes highly similar. Highly similar among individuals from the same nest, highly similar among individuals from different nests in the same environment, and even highly similar among individuals from across their range, saying that there's something about being in that tissue that's structuring the bacterial community, meaning that there's probably some sort of role for those bacteria. Now, as an evolutionary biologist, I love to get down in the guts and dissect out specific tissues and like look at what bacteria are there um, and think about their functional roles in digestion. But I also like to take a step back and think about, well, what does this mean for the evolution of organisms as a whole? And so we've been studying this group of ants, the turtle ants, for quite a while in my lab. And we know a lot about their association with bacterial communities. And what we see is that their bacterial communities are co-evolving with the host. It's a true symbiosis that the ants can't live without the bacteria, and these bacteria are found nowhere else in the world. So there's a true sort of intimate relationship. And we know that these bacteria are upregulating their host's diet. So they're involved in sort of that sort of, you know, nutrient provisioning aspect. But what is true across the rest of ants? So I've said, well, you know, one of the things we want to know is how similar are they to other known herbivores or other known generalists? So in this case, what we have is a, a group of unrelated ants, a group that's entirely herbivorous, and suddenly their bacterial communities and their guts look almost identical, right? So that's pretty you know, nice evidence that it's something about the diet that's driving it. What makes it even more interesting is when we look at other ants that are much more closely related, but have a different diet need, suddenly their bacterial communities look nothing like their closest relatives. But, you know, being a biologist, I thought, okay, well, if we're going to look at an herbivore, if we're going to look at a generalist, I need a predator. So I went out and I collected a predator, and I said, okay, I know what I'm going to get. It's going to be a simple community. It's not going to be very diverse, and it's not going to be co-evolved. And so, you know, but we have to have it, because as a scientist, you have to do everything rigorously. And then I got this, and I thought, 
what the heck just happened? This is incredibly diverse. These three individuals are even from the same nest, and they don't even look that similar, right? The colors of the pie are not identical. And there's a lot of colors. That's not what I expected. And what I realized was I hadn't designed this experiment well, meaning I hadn't thought about the biology of the organisms all that much. So this group of ants are called the bullet ants, right? So you might have heard of these. These are the ones that their sting so painful it feels like you were shot with a gun. There are whole tribes in South America that go through you know, maturation rituals where boys have to wear gloves of these for like 15 minutes, that's insane. Um, but these ants, although they are predacious, they will take down other animals to eat. They actually eat lots of things and they will eat plant-derived nutrients. In addition, unlike the army ants that go out on these group foraging hunts, right, these are essentially solitary hunters. So you can think about it this way. This morning when we all woke up, those of you who might be roommates or partners or really close friends who had breakfast together, brunch, your bacterial communities might have looked similar when we walked in this room because you guys ate something similar. You might live in the same environment. But most of us of you essentially sequenced our microbiome this morning, we'd be pretty diverse. At the end of the night tonight, if we were to sequence our microbial communities, it would look highly similar, right? Because we all are eating and drinking the same exact things. Now that doesn't make them resident members of our gut, but it does tell us something about the bacteria we're introducing into our bodies. So what I said when I saw this was, oh, I just hadn't designed this experiment well. Maybe what's happening is that this just reflects what they encountered last in the environment. So what I did is I took my entire lab down to South America, and we collected lots and lots of colonies of this bullet ant. And what we did is immediately in the wild, so in the rainforest, we took some individuals and preserved them so we could look at their bacterial communities. And the rest we took back to the lab alive and started feeding them on sterile diets to sort of say, okay, if we flush out the noise, what happens to the bacterial communities? Now, the way I'm going to present this is in a, new, a different way. It's called a network-based analysis. So what you're going to see is every one of those circles is an ant sample and the entire bacterial community associated with it. Now, if we have a line that has no connection, what that says is they had a unique bacteria found only in that sample. It wasn't related to anything else. Something about the length of those connections tells us about how similar those bacterial communities are. So you can sort of think about them in the way of a magnet, right? So if you put a magnet together, they're attracted. They're highly similar, so they're drawn together. But if you flip that magnet over, they're repelled from one another, right? Because they're dissimilar. So in this case, if two dots are close together, they're highly similar, these would be highly dissimilar, meaning that the overall bacterial communities were not very alike. And this is what we found. So for all those samples that were caught in the wild, the red samples, we saw diversity of bacteria, just like I'd seen in those pie graphs, right? And so once we fed them on a sterile diet, so some of these individuals were the same exact colony as these others, we suddenly saw that noise go down to something very manageable. So essentially, we flushed out all the noise, and now we can start to ask the question, what are the resident important bacterial community members within the guts of these predatory ants? All right, so now I'm gonna kind of shift gears entirely, and instead of talking about ant biology, I'm gonna talk about ways that I've been able to sort of bring my science to a diverse group of audience. Um, and that's really important. I think that a lot of scientists have sort of neglected the fact that sharing science is and, and, you know, critical. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about some of the diverse tools we've used uh, at the Field Museum and I've used in my lab to sort of make sure that people can understand the science we're doing. I can recognize that some of those graphs are dense and not necessarily easy to digest, so how do we make sure that people understand what we do? And why is it that science communication is important? Why is it critical for us to make sure that people from you know, all parts of society have an understanding of, of the things that are going on? And so one thing I would say is that it's important because we want to make sure that people from you know, lots of kinds of backgrounds are excited about what we do. And not just purely from the, you know, I think it's cool, but in many cases, we can even have funding agencies that require us to do this. So the National Science Foundation, if you receive a grant from them, there's an entire section on how you're gonna fulfill your outreach component of that, that you're gonna share your science with a broader civilization. Um, and it's really important because in the context <coughs> of things like science literacy, who provides most of our funding for science? Those are actually public funding agencies, right? So if you have an informed um, community, they're more likely to support initiatives that are gonna fund future science. Things like NASA, things like the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health. The other reason is that there are a lot of stereotypes about what a scientist is. I mean, the number of times I've told people that I'm a scientist and you can tell they're like, I'm not sure I believe that. 
<laughs> if you've ever been to the Field Museum, we actually have a lab that's behind glass. Our molecular genetics lab is at the DNA um, Discovery Center is behind glass. And there's an opportunity for us to wear a headset and chat with the public. And the first year I arrived, I used to go down and do it quite a bit. And I was always surprised because one of the questions you get asked a lot is, are you real? <laughs> and the first time I was asked that, I thought, do they think I'm like animatronic? Like, I was really surprised by the question. But what they mean is, are you an actor paid by the museum to pretend to be a scientist? Because you don't look like what I think a scientist looks like. And, you know, and that's part of the beauty of being you know, out on public display is that they get to see that we don't always wear a lab coat. Yeah. Rarely are we dealing with funny colored liquids. <laughs> I mean, you know, most of what we do is actually all that glamorous. But, you know, it, I think it's important to sort of break down those stereotypes about what a scientist is. I think it makes science more accept, ex, you know, accessible. More people think, oh, if you're a scientist, I can be a scientist too. Now, as you have just heard, I study bugs. Not everyone's favorite topic. And so stereotypes about what is an entomologist might be even worse than being a scientist, right? So you're either like a happy-go-lucky butterfly <laughs> or you're not a gross thing that are staring at the ground all the time. Um, but you know, so really it's important to sort of break down stereotypes about what it is to be a, an, you know, an entomologist. Um, I remember when I first you know, started telling people I was in school to study insects, they're like, oh, are you here for Orkin? I'm like, it, you know, sure, I mean, you could do that, but it wasn't like my motivation. <laughs> All right, so I just want to sort of share three ways that we've sort of, you know, created or used diverse tools to share our science with the public. And the first is that we take advantage of those opportunities to share our science with the public. Um, we have this great program at the Field Museum called Meet a Scientist, and I think it's every Friday. You can come down for two hours, and we literally take our science out on the public floor and chat. Um, and I absolutely love it. Actually, this is literally five days ago, this is my entire lab group down on the floor talking about ants and DNA and microbes. And it's super fun to sort of hear like, you know, who's engaged and who's not. And you know, you have your repeat offenders. So I actually have a, a, a young man who's been a fan of mine since I arrived at the museum and he shows up to events all the time and I'm watching him grow up and he's a crazy bug kid and I love it, you know. Um, but it's also that we get the opportunity just to like the random person stops by and says, wait, what do you mean there are scientists who work at the field museum? I had no idea. I thought it was just the public exhibits. And that's a great opportunity for us to share that you know, we're there. It's also a great way to empower students to start taking ownership over what they're doing. And not just the science they're doing, but for them to say, I'm a scientist. It's one of the things that, for me, I grappled with. Even as an undergraduate, I mean, I was working in a molecular genetics lab, but I wouldn't have said I was a scientist, right? But I would argue that like, you know, a six-year-old is a scientist. Like, anybody who's asking questions all the time and interested in sort of pursuing, you know, some capacity of testing it or researching it, you're a scientist. Um, another way is to sort of take advantage of all of the ways that you know people you know use multimedia now. Um, we've done a lot of work with videos, and so many of you probably watch videos by Emily Grassley, who runs the Brain School, who we were fortunate enough to you know woo away to our institution. She's fantastic, um, and I've been lucky enough to do three separate videos with her. And so first, I want to highlight this video. So this is a video that the Film Museum created before she arrived, and it's a video I'm particularly proud of. I like the video, I like what I'm conveying in the video. I think it captures the essence of what we do as you know, scientists. Um, and then you look at the number of views, I think it's actually now up to like 3,500. And I was like, whoa, 3,500 people have watched my video, knowing that probably half are my dad, getting <laughs> the reload. But I was like, wow, you know, I've really made an impact. And then we bring Emily Grassley to the museum, and I record a video with her, and look at this number. Yeah. I'm like, holy moly, okay, I thought I was reaching a lot of people. She has the capacity to sort of share our science in a broader venue. And so it's a great way to sort of get what we're doing out there. All right, so another way is blogs. Lots of people blog. It's a really fantastic way to sort of dictate what content you're creating and at what frequency. Um, I'm not a blogger, partially because I'm way too busy, but I've had the opportunity to collaborate on blogs. So I've been a guest blog writer on lots of things. And it's, a, it's actually a really interesting way to craft what you're doing in a mechanism that, you know, you can embed lots of things, but it really makes you think carefully about how do you share your science. Um, interestingly, I think it's important to always be open to new ideas and think outside the box. And so, I don't know how many of you ever played Pokemon. I have not, so I don't know the rules. But the Field Museum created this freely available app on iTunes called Specimania. And the idea is that you get to interact with the kinds of organisms that scientists at the museum actually use, and then you play a game like Pokemon. 
So I don't know how to use it, but I know how to look at my little card. So my little card is a turtle ant, um, and so it's actually really fun that we talk about the science we do. And so you can flip over the card, you can see real pictures <coughs> of it, and then all the questions are sort of dictated by real scientists providing the content, right? So kids or adults are playing this game and also having a little bit of an educational opportunity at the same time. Um, one of the things we often want to do is we want to be able to share our science in the classroom, right? We want to make sure that we're hitting kids early on. And so I was actually really lucky to have some really talented people join my lab. I actually think they're all artists. Hence why this is not ugly, because if I created this, it would be hideous. Um, but not only to do sort of the uh, curation of these specimens, but also to create these high resolution images with the technology <coughs> we have at the museum, and then craft it into some sort of an educational poster. Um, and what we did was we partnered that with a flyer that teachers could then use in the classroom. And the reason that this was critical for me is that all of this work, I had a long-term project studying ants in the Florida Keys, the microbes of the ants and how they interacted. But none of the kids knew I was down there doing research or that the ants in their neighborhoods were cool, right? So what we did is we mailed this poster and flyer back to hundreds of schools around the southern Florida region and also partnered with a lot of the Chicago public school systems to get this poster in their classroom. Now, it's easy enough just to create something, but it's very difficult for teachers to integrate it into the classroom. And that's because they have to hit the next generation learning standards. And so I can send them a poster, and if they don't know where it fits in that, they don't know how to use it. So what we did is we partnered with our education department to ensure that all the aspects of the poster fit with that learning standard that teachers are required by the federal government to integrate into the classroom. And so this is an example of like, exactly how they can incorporate form and function into their classroom at multiple grade levels. Now, the last thing I'm going to finish with this idea of like, how did I become a cartoon character, right? Uh, and, you know, as I alluded to, is a lot of people come to a, a natural history museum and they think it's there for exhibits. So if you go to, you know, the Art Institute or if you go to the Museum of Science and Industry, those are really about the public, you know, interaction. And clearly we have that. Anybody who's spent time in our exhibits knows that that's critical. One of our missions is education and outreach. But another thing that's happening behind the scenes is we have a team of scientists working on the collections we have in the museum. So how do we convey that? How do we tell them there's actually real scientists working in the museum? So I'm a curator professor. There's 21 of us at the museum that engage across all of the natural history sciences. And we have entire research teams and partner scientists. So there's about 150 staff scientists at the museum that are behind the scenes that you guys actually don't see if you just come and see the public exhibits. So we want to have an opportunity to share that there's actually real science happening on those specimens and artifacts you guys see on display. So I already told you about some of our open lab spaces and all the different ways we're trying to share it. But one of the things is we want to incorporate that you know, experience of the visitor with learning something about what we do. So what happened is we created this exhibit called The Romance of Ants, and it was a public museum exhibit, and it had multiple sort of elements to help engage the public. The first of which is it had this giant large ant farm. So this was probably about this big, um, with real ants in it burrowing through this matrix that you could sort of watch in real time. Um, we then had some videos streaming on the back wall of a whole bunch of ant behavior, so you could sort of get a feel for what they were like um, in different environments. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about the larger than life photographs in the cartoon narrative. Um, so this is essentially what it looked like when you walked into the exhibit. So a colleague of mine, Alex Wild, he's this beautiful photograph. So he's actually um, a wildlife photographer and an entomologist who does outstanding science. And he provides these beautiful photos for the exhibit so that we have, you know, real biology of these organisms interacting with the environment. We created some amount of, you know, copy that essentially told us something about the biology. But really it was sort of like, how do you become a scientist? Now, I will tell you that when the exhibit team approached me and they said, listen, we want to start this new uh, museum sort of program, and you're going to be the first one. Everyone will be different, but we're going to cast you as a cartoon. I was like, what? Like, as a scientist, you're never prepared for that. I, was, I actually felt pretty uncomfortable with it. Lucky for me, the person that ended up doing the illustrations is Alexander Westrick, who at the time was an intern for me. And this was completely by chance, because as a scientist, I'm really naive about the arts. So I knew I had this team of people who worked with me who came from an art background. And everyone knew I was going up to talk to the exhibits team about some potential exhibit. And I ran into her first. And she's like, so how did it go? And I said, it was really weird. I was like, they want to make a cartoon about my life. And she's like, wow, that's so cool. She's like, you know, that's my specialty. And I was like, 
what? <laughs> She's like, political cartooning, that's what I do. And I was like, oh. I was like, come with me. So we went upstairs. <laughs> so she ended up doing the cartooning, which was great. And so really what it was was an, uh, an exhibit to sort of explain how did I go from a little girl playing with, you know, pants and bugs on the sidewalk to going off to college to study them to getting a position at a museum where that's my job now, right, to study the evolutionary history of ants. And so you sort of had this, you know, these sort of, you know, ants, you know, decorated on the wall that walked you through the different sort of chapters of my life um, and how I essentially went from that little kid into photographs being in your life. Quite embarrassing. Um, <laughs> playing with bugs on the sidewalk all the way through becoming a scientist. Um, and what we also wanted to do was to share that, you know, that we wanted to empower people who were visiting to sort of pursue their passions. So one of the quotes that I really liked was it said, Don't ever let anyone tell you that a six year old isn't a scientist or can't be a scientist, right? And I totally, truly believe that. Anytime we do those public events on the floor, the smartest questions always come from the kids. And I think it's not that they're smarter, it's they're less inhibited. They just say what they're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you can't read all of this, but essentially what it says is like, you know, so they're asking, you know, I'm telling you all this narrative about what I do at the museum, all my research, there's even stuff about ant bacteria. Uh, but it's like, so what's next for, you know, me? Well, it says it doesn't matter what's next for me, it's what's next for you. Go outside, go study some ants, go to the library, check out books, like, just, you know, watch a nature documentary, go explore yourself. And so it was really about, like, saying, like, let's turn it on you and have a great time. I still get asked, like, how realistic was that cartoon? And I actually tell you, it, it was true. All of the parts of that are um, true. You can actually download the cartoon still up online. Uh, and so, you know, this is a cartoon version of me as a kid playing with ants. And I actually get paid now to go outside and do the same thing. I actually still use cookie crumbs sometimes to attract ants. It's awesome. All right. Um, so how successful was it? Uh, the exhibit was open for in a really small gallery for about two and a half years. We had over 500,000 people walk through the room. So we had a little laser trigger, so we had to divide everything by half because there was only one entrance. We know at a minimum that many people walk through. Um, we also did all kinds of summative evaluations to ensure that we were hitting the mark that we were actually conveying the information we wanted. Uh, and they were quite you know, informative, but one of my favorite quotes was, somebody said about the entire thing was, you know, being a science nerd is perfectly fine. And they didn't mean that in like a positive way. They were like, what I learned is I guess it's okay. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I've, you know, I've, I've accomplished something. <laughs> um, oh, and this is one of my advisors, E.O. Wilson. So he actually came and saw the exhibit. It was really fun. And actually there's a panel of me in grad school chatting with him. And there's a picture of the two of us in front of it. So it's kind of, you know, almost like very totally fun. All right, so what I would argue is that for any of us who are doing, you know, whether it's your art practice or whether it's my science, is that we have to be able to convey what we do to lots of kinds of people. I'm sure you've all had that awkward moment at Thanksgiving dinner where somebody says, what are you doing? And you start talking and you're watching their eyes blaze over, right? So we have to all work constantly on being able to convey what we do and how important it is. Um, and so for me, it's been important to sort of, you know, be innovative and creative, and not always by my own making, but being receptive to all the ways of, that people around me have ideas on how to share what we do. Whether it's people who work with me and my team, or whether it's the exhibits group, I mean, just sort of saying, like, you know, you might be an inch from my lap, you probably have better ideas on how to share them with, you know, your peers than I do. Um, and teaming up with people for me has been really successful. So, you know, I think that I've had to learn to keep my ears open and my mind open when people come to me because it's often hard for me to see the vision right away. And if you're going to team up with, you know, trying to get stuff into the classroom, you really have to work with educators because we can create visually appealing and scientifically informed things, but if it's the teacher don't know, doesn't know how to integrate them in the classroom, it's near impossible for them. Um, and lastly, you know, teaching other people to feel empowered. Like the, the, the science is theirs and that they should have ownership to go out and share it. It's critical. Um, and lastly, that, you know, for me, it's about using any opportunity, being here, right? This is a great way to share with you guys that there's science happening at the museum and that we sequence genomes and microbiomes of ants and that that's important. You may not fully agree, but I will argue it's true. And so clearly this wouldn't be possible without lots of scientific collaborators with all the members of my lab and, of course, funding sources. And I will say that I have one of the most awesome groups of people that, you know, come and work with me and I feel privileged to be able to interact with so if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to take them. And we have five minutes. Uh, thank you.